going all the way back to 1977 uh, with ACORN. Wade was ACORN's founder and chief organizer for uh, 38 years. Uh, I think most of y'all know that Action NC grew up out of what formerly had been ACORN here in North Carolina. Um, we started up as a new organization about six months after the ACORN run ended in the fall of 2009. Uh, Wade is now the chief organizer of ACORN International, also of Local 100, which is a labor union that works in Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas. Isn't that correct? The correct list? Mm -hmm. Also the publisher of Social Policy Magazine, which is a very good periodical about grassroots organizing, progressive activism, and uh, operates a couple of two radio stations now, one in Little Rock, Arkansas, one in New Orleans. One that we're trying to build in New Orleans. Right, yeah. Trying to build in New Orleans. So <laughs> has his hands in a variety of different ways to reach out to our historical constituency, what we have always called low and moderate income people, communities, groups that are affected by issues that all sort of lower income, working income families offer against jobs, wages, housing condition, tenant rights, immigrant rights, health care access, uh, quality of public education, gender equality mm -hmm. issues. Those are the things that actual NC works on. You all know us for. Those are all things that in one way or another we tackle at ACORN during all those years when we're working together. ACORN is a big national organization. Uh, it became very well known, uh, both famous and infamous, for its very effective political operation in lower income communities, registering and mobilizing people to vote. was a subject of a lot of political attack for that activity. That's the, big, the, the main reason why ACORN eventually became undone. Uh, but the good news is that there still is a lot of great grassroots organizing going on out there, not just in this country, but in this world, that has grown out of the work that ACORN did, as evidenced by our organization, and by a lot of what Wade is going to talk about here today. So we've asked him to discuss the operations of ACORN International, different countries in which they're working, especially the ones where they're very active waging campaigns to affect people in those countries, to talk a little bit about his book, Citizens' Wealth, uh, which is work that they are doing. Certainly you're doing it domestically. I'm not quite sure what you're pursuing in other countries, but you can speak to that. One thing in the organizing business is you want to want to work long and hard without feeling like you're really making a difference in people's lives. We have some interesting ideas about how grassroots organizations like ours really can make a difference over time in the quality of life in the communities with the families, with the people that we work to organize around issue-based campaigns but in the end, you know, it's not just about winning the campaign that we're about. It's about building power and changing the balance of power in this country and in this world between the people who have things and don't give them away and share them with others and the people who don't who deserve them. So saying all that, I'm going to turn it over to Wade. He also might have a few things to say about community organizing, grassroots organizing. Yeah. 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 He talks. We'll open up for any questions that people want to ask about anything that gets discussed. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to run out and get the pizza y'all. <laughs> So I just can't tell you how exciting it is for me to see uh, all of you action in the sea. You know, the, the problem with there not being acorn anymore is that one of the things we built over 38 years, at least while I was there, was a very large community around the country of people who were committed and dedicated to building power as low and moderate income families. And, uh, I get to work in 18 different countries around the world, but still you sort of miss some of what's going on in your own country, like the U.S. So to be here and hear the campaigns. Let me say very quickly, and I apologize for this. I don't think there's anybody here who isn't bilingual, is there? We expected a couple of monolingual Spanish speakers. We were going to have an interpretation for that purpose. But I don't think I see any of our members in this room of whom that is true. Before. Okay, good. Just want to make sure we're accommodating everybody. Yeah, here. some of them, uh, like myself, who can spark, hardly speak English, but other than that, <laughs> we're going to all work with each other. Aren't we? Please, please. Uh, um, so, so what, as I was saying, um, we work in 18 countries, which is very exciting, but this is obviously a community where I live as well, and a community of organizers, and 
leaders and members like yourself who have fought so long for justice and power. It's just great for me to spend the day with your chair as I spent much of the afternoon and some of your organizers and Pat, who's an old comrade of mine, to be able to hear how many of the issues are still fights that you're bringing. So uh, with that, I mean, thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity to visit. I was telling Pat, last time I was here, Acorn had a national board meeting right downtown, and we were negotiating with some of these banks, Wachovia and Bank of America, and those, those are evil places uh, in terms of what they've done to people around the country. We were negotiating about predatory lending, and uh, the banks have gotten big, but they're different now since when I was here. I'm not sure if they've learned anything, but luckily with organizations like they haven't okay. learned a damn thing. Okay. That's why organizations like Action and C are here to keep, to keep teaching. So let me tell you a little bit about what we do internationally. And it started from exactly the same process you've seen in your own neighborhoods uh, and here with Action and C. Whether you're a brand new member and it's the first time you've been here, or whether or not you were involved over the years back to Carolina Action. Uh, and North Carolina ACORN. We at ACORN were a membership organization. At the point I left in 2008, we were organizing 100 different cities in the U.S. We had close to a half million members who were at various levels of the organization. And we followed our members. So as our membership grew around the country, not surprisingly, we had a huge number of members who were from the Dominican Republic who lived in New York. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying countries, I'll be okay. Um, who lived in New York, Connecticut, even Massachusetts, and who kept saying over and over again, they'd come as elected delegates to the board from New York or wherever, and they'd say, why can't you work in Sama? Why can't you work in Santiago? Why can't you work in Santo Domingo? And eventually, it's just easier to say, look, we'll go visit, we'll see, we'll t and then next thing you know, we're working in Dominican Republic. Next thing you know, we're working in Tijuana, because we had organizers who worked for us in San Diego lived in Tijuana, and this was before 9-11. So you could go right back and, go back and forth, you know, and it was stupid to pay San Diego rents if you could live in Tijuana, so you lived in TJ. And then we, uh, we had leaders on our board from New Jersey who were from Peru, and housing counselors who were in our housing program all over Los Angeles who were from Peru. And the government changed finally in Peru, where they'd had a dictator, uh, Fujimora, who was defeated in an election by Toledo. And our members on our staff and leaders said, you've got to go down to see, talk to people about rebuilding civil society in Peru. And what do we know about Peru? We're an organization that only works in the United States, but you can't say no to your leaders. That's one of the problems and the assets of being a membership organization. And the members keep saying, nya, 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 nya. what do you end up saying is, see, si, see, si, yes, 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 okay. So, and the very last afternoon before we left Lima, and we were meeting with big people, little people, people all around, we met with two organizations, and the last one, were a organization run by women who were all volunteering, who ran, uh, who were comedores, uh, comedores, comedores. Comedores. And they all ran kitchens in the barrios that for 10 or 20 soles, you could, which is almost nothing in Peruvian money, you could buy a meal. So, we were very impressed, and they said they were doing meals every day for 150,000 people. 1,500 Commodores so throughout, and we visited many of them later over the years. Um, and so we agreed to a partnership with that organization because they wanted to expand and deal with health issues and education issues from that base. Next thing you know, you're working. We brought their leadership to Los Angeles to train with some of our Peruvian leaders and others, and we had a large Latino base in Los Angeles. 
A year later, all of a sudden, we're organizing in San Juan Largancho, a million and a half person, one of the largest mega slums in the world, uh, right outside the borders of Lima. Largely a squatting community, you know, people who had Run, had fled uh, the shining path uh, in many places in rural Peru and ended up sort of squatting. There was no potable water. There was no way, you know, the housing was made of found lumber and paper and whatever. And we, uh, but it had built up a huge community, so we ended up working there. And in every country where we now work as ACORN, and after I left Acorn US in 2008, I worked, we were working in maybe seven or eight countries then. I worked more of my time with the international operation. So now we're in Rome and we're in Prague and we're in, uh, we just affiliated an organization in France and we're in four cities in the United Kingdom, Bristol, Edinburgh, Birmingham, uh, Newcastle, and of course London. How many cities? That's five, I guess, yeah. And then obviously Latin America, where we kept following our members in Mexico City, the NESA. We just talked about that, not yeah, far from... Yeah, from where you are, and in Buenos Aires, uh, where we worked in several neighborhoods and have ended up spending most of our time in La Matanza, which is out in the province of Buenos Aires. And in Quito, Ecuador, and then San Pedro Sula and Tegucigalpa, Honduras, uh, and then, uh, let's see if I got them all there. I may be missing a country in Latin America, but a lot of our countries are in Latin America. We also work in Kenya, in Africa, in, uh, has anybody ever seen the movie Constant Gardener? Okay, well I'll talk to Thank you, my Dominican friend here. Thank you for coming already. It's an LT. That's right. My compañero here is with me. Okay, so that slum is Kibera. That is, you know, well known. We actually work in the oldest slum, 350,000 people, Korogotu, which is not far from there in the way of these things. Uh, we also work in India, where we work in Mumbai, uh, which is a city of 15 million, Delhi, which is where the capital is, and Bengaluru. One of the things that ACORN did that was unusual is it put together, as you know, community and labor work. So part of what we do is not only organize community groups that are membership-based groups of low and moderate income people around survival issues, as you can tell, potable water, title to housing, uh, which take, I can tell you country to country how long it takes to try to get title if you've squatted your land. Um, but we also work with informal workers, whatever you'd like to call them in the U.S., uh, informal or contingent or irregular. These are people who don't have a fixed employer, fixed hours or whatever, but are working a series of jobs. We have a, built a union in Bengaluru and, and in Chennai, which has 35,000 members now, who are all hawkers, street sellers, if you, you know. Uh, you know what I'm talking about from Latin America, yes, but yeah. it's a rare, you don't see that many people who sell food on the street and in public marketplaces. So part of what we've won in India is a right to livelihood, where you have a right for your livelihood to be able to sell on the street. So you can't be displaced, whether it's by the Walmarts or by others, uh, by local corporate, by some giant corporations in India. So this has become very popular because you can only get social, kind of social security benefits if you're part of a union. So an informal worker had no way to get retirement benefits or workmen's, or what we would call workman's compensation. So it's taken a long time. So over the last year and a half, we've seen the membership grow from 6,000 to 35,000. And we think by the end of this year, we may have 50,000 members. And I say all this just to give you a sense of the range of what Acorn International's work is, and essentially the work that came out of the same experience in Acorn, where we worked in media, in low-income neighborhoods, with lower-wage workers. Um, one could argue that the biggest success that 
organized labor had over the last 30, 35 years in the U.S. was in fact organizing informal workers in the U.S. Home health care workers who had no fixed workplace and we worked with them were all making minimum wage, but who now there are five or six hundred thousand members in various unions who started out in acorn groups many times before they were in unions, uh, home daycare workers, uh, home child care workers. Uh, we organized uh, those originally in acorn and then in the partnership with CWA in one case in New Jersey, AFT in New York, with SEIU in many places, organized several hundred thousand of these workers. So the point is, and part of the legacy of ACORN uh, in the U.S. and around the world, is the fact that our base is a membership base of lower moderate income people. We hear those issues first, and we keep listening. So if someone is talking about building a school, or they need a park here, but also says, here's the problem in my work, and I'm not getting paid, and I haven't gotten a check for two months, or these problems, because they're membership problems, are impossible not to hear. And part of the exciting thing about a platform as ACORN has built has been this kind of approach. One of the things Pat said, and um, is that we were going to talk about what I call citizen wealth. And this is one of the things I think is key to understanding what the ability for ACORN to build power for people meant, and what community organization offers as a promise. And citizen wealth is sort of a, it's a cute term. It's a concept you can think about. What in the world does that mean? but it really means income security. Part of what we don't have in this country, and now we're starting to get some attention to that, is income security, where from the time you, until you get to Social Security, you're on your own out here. And Social Security, as some of my sisters and brothers can say, is not that much, uh, no. it's not what you need. No. So what we talk about in Citizen Wealth is what it takes to build income security. And part of, Part of the problem in living in a very conservative country that's very polarized now is even with a democratic history-making president, we have a Republican Congress, it's very hard to win new programs. You can see the fight we're having to make the most out of Affordable Care Act and Obamacare, how the fight we're trying to have everywhere, North Carolina, my state of Louisiana, where I live in New Orleans, Texas, or whatever, to expand Medicaid. So the principle that, that we started developing at ACORN in uh, the 21st century is how to achieve maximum eligible participation. And that's sort of a 50 cent word to say, if the government says you're entitled to it, you should get it. And that's what we believe in ACORN, that if we didn't want to hear, I mean, we didn't want to hear there was a food stamp program and you didn't get food stamps. We didn't want to hear there was a program that said you were entitled to CHIP, the Children's Health Program, and didn't get it. Or if you needed utilities in the summer or in the winter that you didn't get LAHIP if you were qualified for it. Or earned income tax credit, where we made sure that... Um, we had a number of communities where we knew the participation was only 50% in terms of eligible people getting earned income tax credit or child care credit who weren't getting it. Well, this adds up, starts to add up to money eventually. So even if you can't get new programs established, at the least we should get the maximum of what existing program entitlements there are. And we know how to do that. You don't have to be a lawyer to do that. You know, you just have to have, be able to listen, be able to make sure that you're an advocate as a fellow member of ACORN or Action NC with others to make sure that people follow through, get to the appointment, get what's needed. And we would sometimes do this by setting up tax centers where we did taxes for people and by knowing if they were qualified for earned income tax credit, sometimes we'd also see same person as 
entitled to this child care credit, or they're entitled to food stamps they didn't know it, or maybe they weren't signed up to uh, Medicaid. And in 2013, our union uh, worked with what was formerly Louisiana Acorn in Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, to sign up 25,000 people under the Affordable Care Act as navigators. Well, what that did for me as an organizer just involved in that is it made me really learn about the Affordable Care Act. And it turns out there's a lot of opportunities. We talked about a lot of those today. I'm going to make you all listen again. Uh, <laughs> soon. That's the thing. Get up here for a minute. You know, watch out. We're going to learn some stuff here. So what we've done in Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana is we're setting up what we call citizen wealth centers. And we train our members and our organizers in the outreach, and we use the radio station in, in Little Rock for this, because it's 100,000 watts so we can get the word out, to move people through the centers and be able to deal with the whole range of issues that they're eligible for, but also deal with issues that are plaguing people and really end up on the bottom line oppressing people. And what am I talking about? Medical bills, for example. Mm -hmm. 50% of the credit report, negative pieces of a credit report, are based on medical charges. And many of these medical charges are bogus. You don't even know they're there. And some of them are situations where hospitals are supposed to be providing charity care, and instead are billing you the top rate, not the reimbursement rate. So we've had situations, we had one recently out of our Citizen Wealth Center in Little Rock, where a woman desperate came to us. She was actually on Medicare, $13,000 bill at a Catholic institution called St. Vincent's. But the bill just said, pay St. Vincent's $13,000. Nothing was broken down. Now, she knew she'd been sick. I mean, she didn't say, she wasn't pretending she hadn't gone to the hospital, but she's on Medicare. She was like 67, 68 years old. Why was she getting a $13,000 bill? And you know, and I hate to tell you how easy this is, because this is going to make all of us a little bit of shame. We're not on top of our business. So we called down there, and we wrote one letter saying, send us a copy of the bill. And the next thing we heard from them was they knocked off everything but $1,300 of that bill. They knew they were dirty. <laughs> they, they knew they were dirty. They were just, you know, but that's part of the whole problem. There's a, this massive level of rules. You have to be an accountant. You have to be, you know, Albert Einstein's cousin. You have to be able to read, like, you know, a thousand words a minute. And, you know, you've got to be, you know, Clark Kent just about to be able to figure out how to get on Social Security anymore. You know, one of the best-selling books. And I know you're not going to check, check, check with somebody on this, because it's not just me pulling your leg. But one of the best-selling books now, like 250,000 copies, it's a 200-page book about how you get full benefits from Social Security. It turns out almost nobody's getting benefits. All the benefits is what I'm talking about. Maximum eligible participation. I'm not saying you're not getting a little check. I'm saying you're not getting everything you're entitled to in Social Security. And it goes on and on like this. And all these things, you can look at the Affordable Care Act, so complicated. Part of what you get from an organization like Action NC and from ACORN is people who try to collectively put their ideas and wisdom together, talk about themselves, and in that process start to find where we've got some opportunity, maybe some what we call an organizing handles, where so we can grab an issue and win. And here's what we found and we've been talking today about. And under the Affordable Care Act, well, we started too early. Look at all the people that have come in. I mean, this train is running on time. Y'all aren't going to believe what you missed. <laughs> Before we finish, we'll catch all of you up. You're getting the general sense, though. What you really missed is Pat's introduction, because he, he actually, you know, it was blushing. I was blushing. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. The Affordable Care Act says... If you're a nonprofit hospital, tax exempt, you're supposed to give charity care. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. That's supposed to. Mm -hmm. 
Now it's letting them come up with the exact rule and the level that qualifies for charity care. But they now have to have this rule. They have to start knowing what this rule is, January 1st of 2015. And starting January 1st of next year, you go in what you call a penalty phase. If they haven't gotten that rule, don't clearly identify to anyone that they are eligible for charity care at the point they get a bill, 90 days after they're out of the hospital, give them an additional transparent notification that they're eligible for charity care and what those standards are, and then even give them the opportunity six months after they're in the hospital to challenge whether or not that bill was... They can't undertake emergency collection procedures, which means in many states, garnishing your wages. Now, I heard you can't garnish your wages in North Carolina. And you don't have a garnishment law, as I understand, in North Carolina, because you make too little money for them to garnish. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's the damn, that's the true. <laughs> you, know, you know, if we raise the wages up, they probably put in a garnishment law. I'm thinking yeah. you'd lose money, too. But right now, you're so dirt poor, you're like a lot of our states, Texas. They don't even take what little money you're making, but they do put liens on your houses. And they do put liens on your property. And they go to court willy-nilly, a lot of these institutions, from what we've seen with our researchers and talking to your staff here in, in North Carolina. Those are what are called emergency collection procedures. And under this procedure, this, these new rules that I think we can impact, negotiate, and force to be best practice, they can't undertake any of those procedures. Furthermore, you've got this problem, right? They haven't expanded Medicaid. That's right. That's right. You know that. That's been a big issue for you. That's a big issue for all of us. Most of the standards, though, for charity care is 200% of property. Now, if they expanded Medicaid, this gap they talk about is at 138% of Medicaid. So what we're saying is people need to know about this because they need to start demanding. If you don't expand Medicaid, fine. Go ahead, see if you're hurting anybody. We should demand that nonprofits give charity care to all families below 200% of the poverty line. See where I'm going on this? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, demanding and winning, that's a fight, right? La lucha. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we have to struggle here. Um, but this is what an organization can allow you to do by putting enough people together and putting enough brains together and enough of your great leaders. <coughs> we can talk about how you might really put enough pressure from the bottom on these hospitals that they put pressure on these, let's call them Republicans, because they are Republicans in the legislature and the governor's chair, to finally expand this. They're going to have hospitals go out of business. And it goes on and on from there. I know we're going to have some questions on this, but and we don't have the whole campaign. We're still trying to talk to a lot of people, see how they're hurting people. We know from research uh, that Action NC has done and that our people with Acorn International have done, our little volunteer army. We know they're taking liens out on people. So we know they're aggressively trying to collect even these nonprofits. And some of them don't think twice about going to court on it. And there are other hospitals we've looked at elsewhere in the country where I, I don't even want to tell you some of the practices, but, you know, non-profit hospitals that own a for-profit collection agency that, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's just... Now, part of the beauty thing about this new rule is every two years, the IRS has to do a study on whether or not you actually gave charity care like you were supposed to give charity care. And if you don't, what should happen to you? Penalize. Bam. You know how they penalize you? Take away your tax exemption. You make you pay taxes like you and me, you know. But you know, take away your tax exemption, and all of a sudden these hospitals be losing billions of dollars. And one of the things we were talking about today is whether or not these same scoff laws that aren't giving charity care are getting some breaks maybe in the city and counties in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. They're not paying property taxes, some of them. You know they're not, because mm -hmm. they're non-profit. They say they're doing a, they're a fancy hospital. We're, you know, we're looking at them, and to. they're not. So there may be some handles here. Here's what I'm, where I'm going. 
These things have to do with creating citizen wealth in the sense of income security. Because if you know you've got health care, you have more security. Good job, bad job, somebody's ripping you off at work, they're stealing your wages or whatever, you walk out the door. But right now you can't walk out the door, you got no health care, you got no you know, food stamps, you got no nothing. I mean, you need income security. And that gives you power in a job. <coughs> Acorn in 2006, and I just, you know, and incidentally, I got all these books that they're talking about. Here's Citizen Wealth, it's all about what we're talking about. Global grassroots, organizing, community organizing, they're all around the world. And then some of you may have heard of Katrina. Yeah. Ten years ago, hit New Orleans. This is the work that it took Acorn to do, and this is the Battle of the Ninth Ward. Acorn rebuilding New Orleans, the lessons of disaster. You wouldn't believe how important Acorn was in making sure that we actually have people living in some of those neighborhoods. In 2006 alone, if you just look at what Acorn did in four states, Ohio, Michigan, and a couple others, when it forced minimum wage to go up, the benefits went to literally millions of people just in that year and added up to billions of dollars. One of the funny things about the kind of community organizing that you do that I've always done is that people try to say, well, you know, that's not real organizing. That's like stop signs and, you know, you gotta, you know, you gotta do something big. You gotta, you know, it's, Here's the, here's the way it really works. In community organizing, you build power in building gaps. We start with issues that are three things. Specific. It's not in poverty now. It's we want this change now. Immediate. It's not something we're talking about five years from now. When I talk about this, I'm talking about today. I'm talking about January 1st, 2016. I'm not talking about stay with me in 30 years, we'll have a conversation mm -hmm. at my grave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking, I know, I, I look younger. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not. Um, so that's what I mean by immediate. And then realizable. What do I mean by realizable? I mean, things you can win. We have an actual membership. Our membership every day, when they pay dues, they're also doing a mental calculation that says, is this worth my time? Is this worth my money? Is this something I believe in? And with ACORN and with NC, uh, Action NC, we take as a very strong obligation that the organization has to always be about that membership. So those things are true. And what we've seen is those stop signs here and those this, that, and the others there add up to billion dollar victories for millions of people on living wage issues or on the seven million people that we negotiated that own houses because we won and fought for CRA agreements, community reinvestment agreements with banks, or the, the workers who uh, no longer had predatory loans. And these things are very important. There's a book recently, well I wish I'd written this book. <laughs> I don't know why I'm selling this book, but you know, it's, it's called, uh, I have room to write, but uh, Economic, American Insecurity, How Economic Fears Force People into Inaction. Mm -hmm. That's a, mm -hmm. seems like almost a contradictory kind of concept for an organizer. Why would I be talking about a book like this? Cause, but what it, what was fascinating about the book is that and for organizers and leaders and members like you, it said, for example, that we have to be very careful when we're talking to people and we're home visiting or door knocking. A lot of times we would say, well, you know, Acorn's one, this, that, and the other, so we really need you to get involved. And they did some surveys with organizations and found out that when they interviewed those people and you talked too much about your victories, that people were actually thinking, you know, they're winning stuff. They really don't need me. <laughs> uh, they're winning. They don't need me and my money and time. They're good. They're good. So, you know, that's what, and as organizers, we call swallowing the ass. You know, you got to back up off of that, you know, because what you're trying to do is 
get them involved, not have them say, yeah, thanks, yeah, good to see you, hey, you're doing great, whatever, no, I don't think I'll join. No, you're trying to get them involved. And the problem this, this author had in looking at this phenomena of how fear about money leads people not to act is what to do about the problem of ACORN where people who were low income, in fact, were acting. And what he argued, which was so interesting, and, uh, is that the fact that ACORN organized on issues that you could win, often very simple issues, like stop signs, was part of why people felt enabled and empowered to deal with economic issues without fearing that the reaction would hurt them. So I always knew these stop signs were important. And finally, after 45 years in this work, I ran into a professor at Cornell University who wrote a book and said that. So I quote him everywhere now. I put him on my radio show, on my blog. So. But it turns out all these issues add up. And we used to argue if you ever wanted to organize people throughout the U.S. and everywhere in the world, you had to have a program on three issues. Not we, Acorn didn't argue this, I argued this. And what are those three issues? Loose dogs. It's an issue all over the world. You wouldn't believe what loose dogs look like in India. It is frightening. <laughs> and they all look like the same dog. <laughs> you know, just some grungy looking thing and just multiply it out of nowhere, not a hair on it. Oh, you know, that's the ugliest dogs in the world in India. The loose dogs, bad drainage. Okay, not for you, not for you, but for many people in Santiago, yes. <laughs> you know, open sewers and the drainage that, you know, people just dump, I mean, but whatever. <laughs> but what, what's the point I'm trying to make? Is that these simple issues, if you had programs that truly talked about the issues people are articulating that make a difference to them, move people into action. And that's why your name is Action in C, probably, because you understand that you have to Talk is good, action is better. And that's what ACORN always understood very clearly, is you couldn't win by, you know, my daughter used to call it slack division. I thought, uh, slack to visit. Slack to visit. Slack to visit. Slack to visit. <laughs> I thought it was original with her. You know, it's just, you know, it's your daughter. You're so, you know, smart and cute and whatever. And, you know, I used to embarrass her terribly because I'd say, oh, slack to this. You know, my daughter talks about, you just push like and you're a slack to this and whatever. And, and then, of course, everybody, turns out, uses that term. Um, so, but whatever, my point is, social media is not going, I mean, with all due respect, social media is not the same as social change. It still takes people like you, like me, like Pat and the organizing staff, Hector and others, to actually go out and talk to people and listen to people and then try to then do the work, because it's, once you start listening to people and somebody tells you this is what's happening, you actually have to do the work and maybe I read these laws and read these manuals and talk to people on the blower and, you know, go back and forth and talk to others and really figure out what works. And then, once you figure out what might work, you have the next part of organizing, which is whether or not people are willing to act on it. Because people do vote with their feet in organizations. So it might sound good to you, it might look good on paper, you might be able to do a nice graphic on it, you might be able to tweet the thing or, you know, Snapchat it or whatever, but unless, uh, I said, what, I've gotten Snapchat twice, haven't I? You know, I'm not meaning to, but it's just, I can't help myself. You all know what Snapchat is? Because I've got a whole Snapchat lecture before this. Now it's right in my mind. I'm a listener. I listen to all of it. Right now. <laughs> well, citizen wealth is very important to all you Snapchat followers. <laughs> so we talk about building power. And the difference in Acorn, why it had a legacy of almost 40 years, and why it, you know, raised the roof beam so high that it brought uh, the world down on it. Uh, is that, you know, and 
I was on Fox News after all the problems with Acorn. I'd, I'd moved on in, in 2008, but when the lady from Fox News asked me about why, I said, you know, it's, it's actually true. We are very dangerous people. <laughs> and, you know, at some point, I mean, I used to be able to say to a reorganizer ever hired, now look, you know, tell your mama you're never going to be president. But then, the uh, uh, <laughs> community organizer was elected as president. And unfortunately, you can tell he was not that good a community organizer. So now that's my, you know, a good community organizer can't be president, perhaps. Uh, but the point is, we are dangerous people. And the reason we're dangerous people, somebody like me, somebody like, in fact, you are dangerous people, is because we know how to actually talk to people and build power that creates change. And that is dangerous to people. People don't like change. They like it to stay the same. They like to be up here. They like you to be down there. We try to shuffle it up. That's, uh, that's, not, that's not pretty. Uh, it's not pretty how people see that. So here's where we come to. The reason I do these things, and I didn't actually know I was doing this thing, you know, Pat, Told, told you he'd been a comrade of mine for many, many years, and he told me, look, at 6 o'clock, we're going to talk with Hector, and Hector has a couple of uh, journalists we're going to talk to. That's what we're going to do at 6 o'clock. And look what, uh, I don't know what paper any of y'all are writing. For. <laughs> you know, this must be a media town, this Charlotte place. <laughs> wow, and Hector's got some hookups here. But, yeah. but it turned out it was, uh, you know, that was like a, a bow and the present seems to be huge. But the reason I do these things is I'm curious about your questions as well. So I'm going to say one other little small thing. Anybody, all these books are staying in North Carolina. I'm not going to haul books across the country. But they're also for sale and I'm glad to put my name on them and what's left will be in your library. So if anybody wants one of these books, talk to me later. I'm curious what other questions or thoughts you're thinking about. You have a question about ACORN, or what ACORN International is doing, or, you know, what the weather is like in New Orleans this time of year. Okay, help me, brother. Oh, excuse me. Because after you, I'm calling uh, my man here. I, I can use that, that, that analogy you used about the health care and own the hospital. I can use that about myself. Uh, I owe them untold sums of money. This is true. I'm not making this up. They never want to get paid. I have nothing they can take. <laughs> And they can arrest me for it. And they gotta treat me. America, what a country. God loves America, love this country. <laughs> I wonder what the moral of your story is. Yeah, I know. I'm not okay. hearing the model that we can all follow. What, 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 what I'm the, the, uh, I didn't know that I could have that bill reduced, though. That's what I'm telling you. Not only can you have it reduced, but I would almost bet money. That it never should have been as high as it was anyway. Yeah, you're talking about like 9,000 here, 8,000 over there. Yeah, I don't know what they're going to be. Hospitals, and I don't want to get too far in the weeds on this, but hospitals have a standard. Um, yeah. It's, it's a little bit like buying a car, there's a sticker price, there's a top line price they assign to all cars. Yeah. Now, if they get somebody who's got top insurance, got Blue Cross this and that, maybe a supplement or whatever, those people get that top shelf price, they pay it, no, no, so they get away with it. But what they don't do sometimes is realize that affordability and the ability to pay is key in pricing too. So the fact that you have some big shot who's going to pay it is no problem doesn't mean that the same price ought to go for you. So when you read these things, the paper a $50 Band-Aid, and they'll put a, a you know, a, what do they call it, a blood a pressure thing, you know, gloves on you, that you can get at, you know, a CVS or a drugstore for, you know, 10 bucks, all of a sudden you look at and it's $200 for one of those bad boys. You know, it goes on and on like that. Well, if Blue Cross pays it, they get over it. That's their scam. But like any scam, it's our job to make sure we don't get scammed. So if you force them to show you the bill, if you challenge the bill, 
I can almost guarantee you any time you or your organization or advocates do that, you're going to reduce the bill. Because what we demand is the first thing in the Citizen Wealth Centers is that they charge us no higher at least than what the Medicare reimbursement rate is. So, bam, it goes down to that level because not, that's not the top shelf. That's what the government says that, that, price, that procedure or that thing was worth. Well, you shouldn't ever pay more than the government's reimbursement rate. Okay, I have a question from this man here, and then back at Ocean City, I'll catch you. Does, uh, does action address uh, the problem of uh, law enforcement now? In other words, since uh, most of the states are cutting corporate taxes, there's not enough money in the till to run basic government functions. This means that the police, uh, the parole, I uh, have to recoup that money by arresting people. And it's have. a scandal with yeah. it. Talk so, about predatory. Uh, yeah, some so, of that's uh, finally coming out. So you're addressing uh, stuff like that? that when crazy. you ask about action, I'm going to turn to my man here, Mr. Chairman. The best, the best I could answer it, but I would be, you know, the best, the best rule about um, Action NC, we address everything. The more we can help citizens solve their problems, you know, but while we're doing that, we will ask them about getting involved in something that they have. From the problem, we can move them into solving a problem about electoral <laughs> politics, like um, um, community campaigns, cleanup. We work with every all of them. They come in the office for for one thing, and we get them motivated to to help out. You know, we're not charging you to help you out and solve your problem. But um, how would you like to be part of this neighborhood over here that's having a cleanup campaign? You know? So uh, the answer, and, I think, and, yes. Yeah. We, 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 we are meet, in this issue. Will you meet us downtown at, uh, at um, City Hall? But this, what, what you're talking about is a huge issue all over the country. Especially in the South especially in the South. And it's impoverishing people. It's putting, I mean, there's a big, like an expose within the last week about people who are basically being forced into jail because they were not allowed to work because they were losing their driver's license. You know, every, you get a fine, and they put you on court costs, and they put you on interest, and you're one day late, and maybe child support, which, you know, God knows we want to pay, or it's a driver's license problem, the parking ticket. Next thing you know, you lose your driver's license. You, yep, you're a truck driver. How are you going to work? So you then work without a driver's license. What are you going to do? And then you get caught without a driver's license. Then what's going to happen to you? <laughs> this is me looking at you. <laughs> Buying a jail cell. And then what does that do? So this is a huge issue. And the, the one of the only good things that's come out of the Ferguson problem was that that was a city that was running on those kind of fines. And they were only the seventh or eleventh worst in that area of St. Louis County in terms of that same procedure. This is crazy. But there's a great book uh, about Philadelphia, same problem that came out a year and a half ago. I mean, this is North this, Charleston. Huh? Same North, North Charleston, South. exactly right. You were saying you mm spent -hmm. time there. Okay, Ocean City. My question was that. I've had several searches, and out of them, I'm, I owe over a half a million dollars, um, which I can't take. No, that's obvious. I have Medicaid. I have Medicare. Um, Even and, with Medicare, you, um, you've got a half million dollars in bills? I still have a half a million. It was more than that, but I'm just yeah. saying where I'm at now is a half a million. So I have the worst credit in the world. You know, I can't buy a candy bar or a drink because of my two hundred and fifty thousand, you know, hundred well, half a million dollars. Anyway, um I had two hip, two knees replaced, two hips replaced, two back surgeries, two fusions, I have six titanium screws in my back. I'm the walking bionic woman. So but in saying all of this, these surgeries were necessary in order sure. to be sitting here now. And when the process, I was supposed to go in as a test case, first of all, 
when I had gastroenteritis bypass. I'm case number nine in the study. So therefore, my surgery was supposed to have been three. But 20 years have passed, and all of a sudden, I get a bill now about my gastroenteritis bypass surgery. I've had another one since then. That doesn't show what up. What hospital? Harlem Hospital in New York City. Oh. Mm. And is that a for-profit or a non-profit hospital? Um, Harlem is the neighborhood hospital, and it's non-profit, basically. It's non-charity, because it serves everybody. The affiliation is coming to Presbyterian Hospital. Oh, I had Presbyterians the last one I've got. But the oh. all hospitals are still the issue. It's going to be Presbyterian. Oh, okay, I hear what you're oh, saying. Oh, really? That's it's a subsidiary hospital of Columbia Presbyterian? Yeah. yeah. That's oh. what okay, I don't want to get too deep in it. Now yeah. we're going to be all done in New York. I'm with you, but I don't want to lose everybody else. Okay, so here's my bottom line. That, that bill can't be legitimate. I mean, for one thing, there's a statute of limitations even in New York yeah. for when a bill is no good. And it's yeah. usually at the least, you know, three years, at the most, ten years. The notion that you can get a bill for a procedure 20 years later? Uh, but see, the, I, didn't know, I didn't know they were connected, so now that makes sense. Home um, Hospital, um, evidently when I had my surgery down here at Presbyterian, it kicked those of my name the same. I haven't changed names. My age, my social security, everything is the same. So I guess they compared it, and boom. I, I wouldn't be so sure of that, but I do know this. Make sure you talk to somebody about yeah. this. This bill is bogus. I mean, you're not paying it anyway. No. So I, know, I know you're not losing a lot of sleep on it, but still, what if you really needed a candy bar? What if you needed a candy bar? I can't buy it. Can't buy it. And we can't have that. So we're gonna, we're gonna. I don't see Pat here right now, but we need to take a look at this bill. Um, okay, so I'll go with you next, and then you. Yeah, I think one of the strengths of the labor unions and the reason they were feared so much was not because they were labor unions, it was because they were able to get out the vote. So I'm curious because what I have seen is activists don't have a very high percentage of voting. What are you doing to get activists to actually register to vote and to actually vote? Because when you walk into a congressman or a state senator or, or, or someone's office to do FaceTime, and if they know that your group has a very low percentage of voting, your, your clout seems to diminish uh, whatever your argument is. The one thing that distinguished ACORN from every other community organization in, uh, since 1972 before most of you were born, or many of you. ACORN was a nonprofit, of course, but it wasn't tax exempt. There was never any restriction on our members. Anytime our members put their hands up and voted in the majority yes, if they wanted to do something, we could do it, including politically. So there are no, we never had any reason we couldn't be political, if you will. Um, so we always, in fact, were political, and starting in 1972, we were founded in Little Rock, uh, June 18th of 1970. We endorsed people for school board, and for the first time won without winning in the rich precincts, and it sort of set up a revolution in that city of sorts. We then ran a lot of our members and took over the county legislative body, uh, which calls itself. So, Ever since 1971, we have been registering voters. And we ran our members, and sometimes our members were elected. And of course, they weren't lawyers, they weren't doctors, they weren't professors, they were working people, or they were on Social Security, or in fact, they were on, oh my God, welfare. Uh, and still, they were elected to offices. Uh, the first member I ever signed up and got to pay dues, Gloria Wilson, south end of Little Rock, ended up as a elected city director for that whole area of Little Rock within 10 years. So that was, we didn't, community organizing at the point I founded ACORN to find power as, well, poor people, rich people have money, poor people have numbers. So if we have enough numbers, we'll win. The problem was our members didn't understand power that way. They understood power as elections. And so most community organizations, particularly in the 
the tradition of Saul Alinsky were apolitical. You couldn't get involved in politics. You should stay away from politics. It divides people. Our view was, we'll trust the membership. We won't divide people because before we endorse a candidate, I mean, it took, it, it took four ballots of our national board before Barack Obama in 2008 got the 75% to be endorsed. Well, why was that? <coughs> John Edwards had a lot of support because he'd been with us on our living wage campaign from North Carolina. Hillary Clinton, the New York people were down and all the way for Hillary Clinton. And, you know, we're experts, you know, you remember that. I mean, they, they you know, so we couldn't get this. We weren't going to divide the organization. But finally, you know, over time and as the momentum built up, the rest of the, you know, the votes came together and we ended up endorsing Barack Obama. But my point is, we were political, but that's also, we courted the storm. I, I, I guess I think you misunderstood what I was trying to say. I'm not suggesting that any non-profit non, non group should ever endorse anyone. That's part of the law. No, it's not. Uh, well, they can endorse. Uh, yes, they can. I just told you they can. Not, not if they want to keep their non-profit uh, uh, status. Yes, they can to keep a non-profit status. What not I'm, a tax exempt status. Exactly. That's, a, that's my point. But a lot of people, and I don't mean to make this a big yeah. issue, but you, we shouldn't confuse tax yeah. exempt. Acorn didn't have to pay taxes because yeah. we spent, we never had big excess money. We were a big organization, but. I, I guess what, I'm, what, what I was uh, uh, curious about was what is the effort to, uh, to get people who are joining like Action NC and so forth not to decide who they're going to support, but just to register to vote and to vote. And they make a decision who they want to vote for. Because I have found so many activists on the trips that I have been to, and the first thing I say is, are you registered to vote? No. Nope. Are you registered to vote? No. Nope. And I, I can't answer. You know, I left ACORN in 2008, and obviously in 2009, they were attacked for voter registration. They were attacked in the Obama campaign for four years. The majority of Republicans believe that ACORN stole the election for Obama. Unfortunately, what part of the impact of that is that many community-based organizations, after what happened to ACORN, were afraid to do voter registration. That's they were unfortunately, the Fox Newsers, the haters, the Republicans were very successful. Now as I understand it, Action NC is part of a coalition now that's involved in voter registration. Yeah, we have a um, C3 and a C4. But for a C4 couple of years, people just didn't want to touch it. And because, look what happened to ACORN. You know, the bigger they fall, but it fell hard. I'm not mistaken. I think what he's saying is, Action MC members and other organizations members are not ready to vote. That's what he That's said, what and, we're yeah. gonna, and I think they're starting to be an effort. About registering people. Yeah. 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 yeah, we are in that might be involved with very few, and they're not ready to vote, and they don't vote. Well, I think there's two problems, and both of those problems are important. One, if we got all the people who are our people, who are already registered to actually vote, we'd win every election regardless of who's not registered. So there are always two parts of every campaign, getting people who aren't registered registered and getting everybody who is registered to actually vote. Okay. Well, the same thing about voting. I don't remember a candidate for anything going on asking for my vote. They asked for my money, but they never asked for my vote. Got a mayor candidate that keeps sending emails. Got all, all they want is the money. And I'm looking for ways to get people to vote. I hear you. Me? Yes, ma'am. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> well, I was my Thank God, it's you. I know. I was, I was going to say, you had your hand up, huh? I did. I did. Okay. <laughs> your turn. Time to go. Um, well, my question is about um, how, how the work is done and how the connections yes. are made. There are so many organizers, activists who are new, and I want to know if ACORN has the best practices. I'm mm actually -hmm. see, or I mean, if from Acorn, or yeah, yeah. were there because of the, the history? I answer Acorn it, questions right. all the time, They're right? But the you know, if there is, um, if there is a best practices manual, um, either um, via 
Uh, we can do it through storytelling, or um, is it written? Because there are so many um, new activists, and there's just so much history, rich history, of organizing, and I'm not sure I'm seeing that in the work that's done currently with the new generation of organizers. Okay. Good question. Now, of course, I believe we have the best practice. <laughs> the best. best yeah, absolutely practice. best practice. What a question to ask me. No. We have, yeah, so that was... Where is it? Where, where, where now you're going to ask me where it's written down. Yeah. Where so, it's written, who do we talk to, the tool what mountain? Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> here, here, here's what I suggest. You know, in the same way we've taped most of this, we put it on YouTube. Okay. Partly because... We want these, these kind of dialogues, these conversations. And if any of you are in a witness protection program, I usually <laughs> ask earlier in case, be careful, the camera is mainly this angle. So those of you in a witness protection program, leave that and you know, towards the back when you leave. But we put this up on, we put these kind of exercises up on training, everything from door knocking to how to do a meeting to how to set up campaigns to conversations back and forth just like we're having, okay? Um, I am within that close of finishing a book I've been writing for 10 years called Nuts and Bolts, the ACORN Methodology of Organizing, because so many of our international and other countries, obviously, they don't even have our experience in the U.S. We kind of all know what we're talking about when we talk about issues, but you can imagine if I'm in England or France or India, who cares what happens in the U.S.? I know it's hard for you all in the U.S. to understand this, but the U.S. is really only a little small piece of the world, and the big world, it's, you know, minimum wage, but we, you know, uh, it doesn't, that's not, it's a different thing. Salario uh, minimal, I mean, you wouldn't want to know what the system in Mexico is. The, 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 point, the point is, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the point is, I think, the people here in the United States start and play the people in the government show and we need to change that. We remember we have a power. But they put, they show what they play, they want to play, and we start going for this game. And we need to change this.